Okay, so my name is um, Evan Floden. I'm from um, Secure Labs. And the title of my talk um, kind of gives away a little bit um, uh, sort of the reasons why we, why we created Secure Labs. So um, we launched um, around 10 months ago, so at the conference last year. Um, and we sort of described a little bit about what we were trying to do with Secure Labs, what was the reason behind um, uh, f forming the company. And I'll just give a little bit of a background for, the, for those who, do, who don't know about it. So um, some of the kind of premises is that, we're, that we're working on, um, obviously in life sciences, we all know that the large amounts of data which have been, um, which have been processed and in the future how, how they'll be processed, um, how people are essentially doing this computation and where they're doing it is increasingly so moving from on-premise and into the cloud, the challenges associated with that. And we also believe that that, that this uh, will be replicated across different industries, so not just in life sciences where, where Nextflow is um, particularly strong, but into, into other areas as well. So together this provides, um, as I said, enormous opportunities, but there's still enormous challenges with, with running these workflows in, in different locations. So um, to deal with this, we're thinking about the, the portability of the workflows. Um, this is essential, um, particularly in, in look, sometimes when we have regulated environments where the data is, is not able to move. If the data um, does become very large, sometimes it's easier to move um, the compute um, to the data so that the workflow is essentially um, being executed at the location of the data. We also have problems around uh, optimization. So if you're doing that, then how are you going to optimize the workflow um, for the infrastructure that, that you're using and, and doing that in a kind of smart way. And we're also um, thinking about how we can run these scientific workflows um, in, in areas of, of compliance. So when people are running in highly regulated environments, we want to, we want to, give, to work with them so that they can have the compliance that, so that they're required um, to run the workflows um, in that way. So Nextflow provides us some of these things we've seen before. So we have code, which we can write in any language. We can then wrap the dependencies um, with containers or a conda like we saw before. And then this is all pulled together um, through a sort of functional approach with the data flow programming. The code itself is then, is then deployed on our different environment scenarios. And we can use um, tools like GitHub to track it. And Nextflow itself is just an open source um, tool licensed under Apache 2.0. And it's been widely adopted and also widely adopted in production environments. Um, we can see over the last 18 months in particular, we've seen um, a massive increase in the, in the users of Nextflow and particularly in the kind of production environment settings. But we still think there's, there's lots of work to do and there's, there's still many improvements which can be made um, to that. Um, some of this is around, so to start with, a lot of the things we've been focused on is on training. So um, as Secure Labs, we've been providing training um, to institutes or companies that wish to have, have it. Um, we've, we've been, I think we've done eight or nine so far, or eight or nine have been booked um, for the future. And this has mostly been around a two-day workshop where we do one day looking at how we can learn about Nextflow um, in terms of the, the structure of the language. And then we spend a day looking at the deployment scenarios and, and how you can use Nextflow in this way. And so this is what the, uh, the first two days we had. We're also thinking about, um, you know, we have a limited reach in, in terms of uh, how many people we can, how many people can go and teach in person. So the online effort um, will, will make a big difference as well. And for that, um, we uh, currently have a, a new website, which we'll be launching next week. Um, I can give you a, a quick demo of that. Um, we didn't want to do too many things at, at, at once, but... Um, in terms of what we have this week, so the, the the focus of the of the new of the new website will be really around some, having some more learning material. So there's examples for people to learn from, a little bit more on the basic concepts, and some tutorials. So this will be stuff that like you would normally get, you could possibly get in one of the training lessons um, that we don't um, currently have online. Um, so let's give you an example of some of these things down here. We we can look at the basic concepts, simple pipelines, so RNA seq workflows um, as well. And then obviously the implementation patterns, which have become increasingly used for people. We also have a new section um, we're going to put on really around the community. And this will be just so people exactly know where to ask for help, how they can get help, issue tracker, and a link to NF Core um, for people there. And finally, a new section on events where we can host, where we can have events like this, or if people organize meetups or events around Nextflow, that they can um, get together 
Also, when we have training events, people know where to go. And, and that information can be, can be found from the NextFlow website. So go back to here. So as well as the, the effort that we've been putting into training, um, we've also been uh, offering software support services. Uh, so this is for companies or, or, or people who are running in production environments and they need to run a certain version of NextFlow. We can guarantee um, bug fixes for up to two years on that. Um, we're also able to offer private issue tracking. So when you're not working in a fully open environment, when your code is proprietary, you may wish to be able to um, effectively communicate the issues, but in a, in a private manner. Um, so for that, we have private issue tracking, as well as a help desk for people um, who, who need support um, around the clock. Beyond the, the support services, um, we've been porting um, some pipelines for clients, and this has been um, a really interesting process. So essentially moving pipelines from um, other, the, more of the proprietary um, large-scale um, developers and putting them into NextFlow. Um, it's been, been a very, uh, very very good process to do. And then around the deployment environment, so helping people set up, uh, for example, AWS Batch for them, how they can create the environment that runs in a really effective way um, for, the, for the solution we're trying to solve for them. And kind of working with these, working um, in, this, in this manner, is, is, as I said, has been very useful for us. It's helping to guide the NextFlow de development itself as well. So you know, DSL2 becomes incredibly important in terms of modularization when you have massive production pipelines of 50, 60, 70 processes. Managing that in a single NextFlow script would not be possible. Also, I mean, it's touched on a little bit earlier today, and I think this over the next year this will be, be very important is around the testing. So now that we have modules, we can, we can start to build in proper unit testing. Um, integration testing of the complete pipelines and, and possibly even some regression testing um, as, as Phil was mentioning before. Um, so how, how, you, how we manage that module structure is, is still up in the air and I think it's something I'd like to discuss over the next two days. If, if you imagine that you have a module which might contain your next flow script, you might also want some unit testing data in there. You might want some description of how those tests would run. Um, you, you might uh, you might want some let's say documentation. Yeah, how, how we how we manage that and how we how we um, structure that so that NextFlow can use that information as much as possible that will become really important. We think but ultimately around all these service things. So um, NextFlow has been a you know a really good tool. It's a, but it's it still has its limitations. It's a single user tool. Um, you can launch a single execution of a pipeline at a time, um, and it's still a, a command line tool. Now, ultimately, the you know one of the visions of Secure Labs is we really want to have this idea that you can deploy optimized workflows in the cloud for the best available price with with a single action. And today, um, I'd like to we'd like to announce um, a new product which should help us on on achieving this goal, and that's uh, Nextflow Tower. So NextFlow Tower um, is, a, is a new product we've been working on for a couple of months. Um, it's uh, currently in a, a beta release. Um, if we look at it here, it's essentially able to monitor workflows anywhere. And when I say anywhere, it's, 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 very di it's quite different from um, any other solutions we've seen so far. So you're able to launch pipelines from anywhere. So this is if you're launching it on your laptop. They can be then deployed anywhere. So if they're deployed in the cloud, um, and then you can monitor them from anywhere as well. At the same time, the whole application stack can be deployed anywhere. So you can pull the whole stack up on your laptop if you want. Um, it has seamless integration with NextFlow. Oh, sorry. So um, in, the, in this case, you're able to just simply take any NextFlow pipeline, new or existing, um, and run it with NextFlow Tower. We're simply adding it with, flower, uh, with Tower flag. And the product itself is open source uh, MPL2. So this is a Mozilla public license used for example for Firefox um, and it'll be available on, on GitHub. I'm just going to run through a, a little uh, some sort of demos now to, to show you how it works. I can do this here. Okay. Sorry. Okay, there, there. So in the first example here I'm just going to be running on my local computer. Um, essentially what I'm able to do is just say, put this with tower flag. The actual address of it itself, we have this uh, email uh, location here. 
sorry, I'll just sign it off there. So the, the address of the hosted service, which we have currently, is tower.nf. You're able to simply sign in here. It doesn't have a, a password. It's based on authorization for your email. So I put the email in here, my email that I currently have. Uh, and this will just send me an email to my, uh, to my email I have here. I've got some more. <laughs> All right. And when I do this now, I, it launches up the application there. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have a history of all my executions, which I've run. I'm able to delete those. I can see the names of, of, of what they've um, been doing there. I'm also able to search for here, so I can, if I wanted to search for RNA-seq, it would, it would pop up here. Um, I'm able to um, launch pipelines themselves. So first I'm going to do a demo, as I said before, for running from locally. So when I do this um, on my local computer, this is just a, a, a foo pipeline doesn't do too much. But then when, I'm, when I see here, I'm starting from the, from the tower um, location. It will take a second to come up. Yeah. It'll take a oh, What's happening here? I'm using it the right version. Oh, really? I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> let, me, let me see here. OK, I've got two demos. So in this demo here, I'm going to um, I'm going to, now I'm going jumping onto the cluster. I'm going to launch three pipelines. One I'm going to run with uh, Univer Grid Engine, one I'm going to run on AWS Batch, and one of them I'm going to um, run on Grid Engine and other game as well. If I go here, <coughs> you can see that the pipelines just automatically pop up, so it didn't, independent of where I was running them from, and I can now track them um, as they go through. So the interface itself, um, I have a, have a command line which was run um, at the time. I can have a list of the parameters here. I can see uh, exactly what parameters were entered in, the configuration that was, that was the next flow used. Now I zoom out here a bit. And then we have a, 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 some general information about the pipeline, for example, when it was started. This is the versioning around GitHub, um, the, the, the working directory that's used. In this case, you can see here I'm using an S3 bucket. Uh, this one's running on uh, AWS Batch. And this updates, so we, we have a timer every four or five seconds, which will essentially update this information and run through. Um, we can go, can go through here and you see a list of the processes, um, whether they be submitted, which state they're in at the time. And then we have some aggregate statistics on, on the tasks which have finished, so the total memory which is used, etc. It can go through and show you some of the ones that have completed. So in this case here, you can, you can see that um, in total the, the, the pipeline took six minutes to run. We had uh, um, 0 0.1 CPU hours and, and it read 6.4 gigabytes to disk. Here's some information around the utilization. So you can see at the maximum point, um, this is a kind of a load. So it goes up and down depending on the usage in terms of the number of cores you requested. I think RNA-seq requests two cores per task on so that would say so the 11 tasks max would have done, would have done 22 cores at the peak and then we have a, a memory efficiency so this is just how much memory did each of the tasks use relative to how much it requested and this is quite important for if you want to try and optimize um, your your resources particularly when you're requesting them to a cluster onto the cloud so i'll go up to my nf rna seq pipeline here you can see that we have 12 submitted in my batch um i share i should end up seeing that I've got 12 jobs which have just started. So the, the idea is, is that this, this should correspond with whatever um, system you have running. If I was to go over here and look in my um, QStat, so here you can see that those jobs are running on the cluster, but I have a centralized location here where I can monitor this material, uh, all of this information um, from inside Tower itself. We also have a, at the uh, lower down here, we have this um, table which is essentially the task table, which is coming out. Um, currently, you can access it um, with the reports. Um, here, it's a live updated version. Um, so as these, as these um, tasks get updated, you can see here that they, they become running there. And if I was to click on any of these, for example, this one, the make index, 
I'm able to I'm able to observe the actual information inside here. So I can see the command that was run. I can see um, exactly if it had an exit status. Let's go to this. Doing too fast. Here we go. I can see the uh, if there's an exit status, the work directories, and then all the information that you traditionally get from um, uh, from from the reporting. Okay. So I'll show you through there. And finally, at the on the completion of the reports, so a completion of the workflows, you're able to see the rep, the reports which come out. So this is the resource reported usage around CPU usage, memory usage, etc., for each of the different processes. And this is taken from um, some work. Um, I think Phil was the main author of this a couple a couple of years ago at one of the hackathons. Yeah, he's already a contributor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Pretty good. So, I think then we'll go, I'll just describe a little bit about how it works in the background. So, on the right hand side here, you have a, a, get, a getting started panel that tells you how to do it, starting from real basics. You install Nextflow, you have a token, and this token essentially links your Nextflow execution with, with the server. And then you have um, you have to use the latest version of Nextflow. In this case, this is the Edge release of Nextflow, which we just released um, yesterday. And then you can run, as I say, any workflow you like with Tower. Alternatively, if you don't want to put in the token every time, um, you're able to put this into your Nextflow config. So we have this new um, new Tower uh, Tower scope where you can include the access token and run with Tower. You have a profile, basic profile around yourself. You can put a, uh, an avatar in there, um, description of, of, of what you do, as well as a list of your tokens. So these are tokens which, which can be tied to the execution environment and you can remove them, add them, share them if, if, if you wanted to share the execution. <coughs> okay, so that's a summary of, of what we have there. Let's go a little bit around um, a little bit of the details of, of the implementation. So it was um, the basis of, of Nextflow Tower is around Micronauts, and Micronaut um, is a microservices framework that's made uh, for the Java virtual machine. And we wanted to use this because Nextflow is obviously written in Groovy based on the, based on a very similar technology. So we keep the technologies um, development um, can be tied together quite nicely without having to learn. Um, new frameworks. The other thing that's um, quite cool about it is that it makes it very flexible for um, incorporating in um, different different technologies. So the, the the database, for example, is agnostic. You can use whichever database um, you want. I think currently we have um, MySQL version running. So that our cloud deployment that we have is currently running on AWS um, using some Kubernetes technology to um, tie the whole thing together and bring it up. But yeah, you're, you're very flexible in, into what you into what you can do to bring this together. In terms of the roadmap for the future, um, so we can see that obviously Nextflow is, is currently giving us the, the language and the logic. We have the containers which we brought in, the execution engines, and now we're um, uh, currently looking into the monitoring here. In the future, how are we going to how are we going to go about it? Well, we want to provide. Um, real enterprise features for people running these workflows. So cloud budgeting um, becomes a very important issue around knowing how much the, how much your workflow will run um, beforehand and actually accounting for all of those costs. Um, information more around the database, so having having good records of it and metadata and and being able to search through the history of your of your executions. AI prediction, so using that data then to be able to predict the resources that will be required for a given um, for a given execution at the task level in real time and then using that information to create the cloud environment on the fly and then deploy this in a very smart way so that the workflows can essentially be um, uh, done done much more effectively but still in a really transparent manner as I said we also want to do this in a way where we are um, really enabling the compliance um, a lot of the people, a lot of, a lot of the organizations um, are running this, are using, are running Nextflow, are using data in, uh, in, in very sensitive environments, and we need to uh, enable them to keep them informed, work with them so that they can uh, meet those requirements and keep this in mind whilst, whilst we're doing this. Finally, what's the, the long-term vision of this? So it's the, one thing um, 
we're really keeping in mind is we do not want this to be a, like, a, like a platform, like a cloud platform in itself. We're very much inspired by um, the works of, of, of the likes of HashiCorp, where they're really strongly focused on, on making like provisional tools that are command line based, that are high quality, that are open source, um, and that are really driving the technology forward, and then providing the services around them, um, the cloud services around them to enable them in the enterprise setting. And as I said before, that, that's, that's uh, keep, we're keeping the focus on Nextflow itself. And also abstract, not, not sort of um, abstracting away the workflow deployment, but not the technology. So you still know that you're running on batch if you're, you still know you're running on a cloud and you can still inspect the logs if you wish to. We don't want to try and let's say create a platform which, which removes all that information um, for people who, who may need to access it at any given time. And with that, um, so at the moment we have the tower, the, the cloud version, it's in beta, and we'd love to hear your feedback on it. Um, so today, everyone who's, who's registered, we've used um, your email and added you to a whitelist, so you're able to go on, give it a go, try it out. Um, there'll be the GitHub page will be up later on today. Sorry, the GitHub page will be later on today. And we have a Gitter channel. Um, send us your feedback. Um, we've, obviously, there's going to be many things which we want to improve. We wanted to release it quite early so that we could really get iterate really fast, get, get feedback on the features that people want, what they like, what they don't like, and, and move forward. Um, but yeah, thanks for your time. And I, I, if you have any questions about this, I'd be happy to give, show you a demo over the next couple of days. Um, for sure, will be around. And, and yeah, thanks a lot.